This is a special Point of the Spear presentation, George Washington at War. Today's guest has portrayed General George Washington at national reenactments and in numerous television and theatrical productions. Living historian and author John Koopman III is here, and I'll speak with him next. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of the Spear. Gift-giving season is here, and for the military history lover on your list, check out my book about the Black Medal of Honor recipients of World War II. Immortal Valor chronicles these timeless heroes' life journeys through all the pain and struggle until their ultimate triumphs. I hope you purchase the book or audiobook, which is available now in stores and online. This book is called George Washington at War, 1776. And author John Koopman III joins us now. John, welcome to the show and Merry Christmas to you, sir. Well, thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure, sir. And uh, for listeners, John and I have worked together on one of my films called America's First D-Day, where he portrayed Washington, as he uh, always does so well. So we're honored to have you on the show, John, very much so. Before we get into the book, I wanted to ask about other aspects of Washington's service, and in particular, the French and Indian War. Washington was considered a, um, an aide-de-camp, but a, he was not in, in the pay. He didn't have rank, uh, but he was an, an aide to uh, General Braddock, British uh, Army officer. And Braddock had disdain for what was called the provincial units. Now, these would be, uh, there were some units from South Carolina, there was a New York uh, independent unit, and then, of course, there were the Virginians. They took up to fighting uh, in the, um, what's called the Indian style, which Braddock frowned upon, but they ended up saving complete catastrophe and annihilation. And I must add, the allure of the baggage train. <laughs> The Indians became so fascinated by the baggage that that probably saved a lot of lives too, because they would have, they didn't necessarily chase them across the Monongahela again. But this is yeah. where Washington really shined. Uh, now, there again, I want to read a, an actual. This is an account that he wrote uh, to his his uh, his brother. By the all powerful dispensations of providence, I have been protected beyond all human probability and expectation, for I had four bullets through my coat, two horses shot up for me, yet escaped unhurt. Although death was leveling my companions on every side. So of all the officers, he was one of the sole remaining officers and he organized a, an orderly retreat, kind of a fire and retire. And it was, there's nothing to say beyond it was simply miraculous that he was not hit, as you can see from the volume of bullets flying in the air. I have that same quote, actually, <laughs> okay. in my, my research, because right. I know of the, um, of the legend of his not being wounded or any of the bullets uh, harming him. And I just want to add that I'm not sure if this is true, but when he was going through that same area 15 years later, an Indian, old Indian chief sought him out and described how they recognized his bravery and they took aim upon him, but none of the, and they were some of the best marksmen the Native Americans had, but none of the well, it struck him, the, the ball struck him. And after a while, the Indian chief said, this man is protected by divine providence. We won't fire on him, you know, for the remainder of the battle. And I don't know how true that is, but it's, it was a story. Uh, so the, yeah, the historian, the, who I respect, that is like Edward Lengel, he's a, he's a Washington historian, and he, refers to it as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a legend. Uh, certain uh, historians dispute it because Washington never mentions it, but his son, uh, George Washington Park Custis, thought so much of it, the stories he had heard that he wrote a play. And I don't think 
George Washington Park Custis was a clever enough fellow to make this story up. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think he he heard this story from friends of Washington. There was this Dr. Craig who was with Washington when this potentially happened. So I know historians dispute it, but personally, I think it's true. And um, I think historians don't like it because it's not a primary source, but yet we have a secondary source. And anyway, I hold to it that it's true. But what did actually happen was, we know for sure, was that there was a Presbyterian minister gave a sermon who said it's actually the same thing, that this, this young man, Washington, has been preserved for some future importance for our country. So. So that is 100% documented. But I, I personally hold, I, I think that that Indian story is true. Yeah, yeah. it, it seemed as I was reading it, um, the way it was phrased, that it, that it would be true because yeah. this uh, chief sought him out. Um, I want to move forward to the interwar years after the French and Indian War, before the revolution. What was Washington working on between those wars? Well, I think certain historians, I think I missed the, they missed the importance of these years, uh, because as a young man, uh, when he was involved in the French Indian War, he seemed to be very much localized. He was thinking of Virginia. What, what's the good of Virginia? He, he disputed the Forbes role. There was a Forbes expedition later that was successful with 6,000 men in, in 1759, uh, I'm sorry, 1758. But um, those interwar years were critical because something transformational happened in his character and that it was almost like he went to some sort of graduate school or college and that I think a lot of it had to do with one of his neighbors, George Mason. Um, he didn't venture forth much out of his library, but he was a brilliant man. So his Washington's mind greatly expanded in his thinking during those 14 or so years from the, his involvement in the French and Indian War until the beginning of the revolution where he was growing, he always wanted to be an English gentleman. That was his goal, to be an English gentleman. Hmm. And certain things happened. He, he tried to get commissioned in the British Army. He was denied that. And of course, that hurt him. And then he saw other things that he disliked, and he gradually transitioned into wanting to separate. So those interwar years were critical, I think, through his own self-study, association with George Mason and other thinkers like that, he, he was transformed and prepared him for what he had to do in the revolution and thereafter. I hope you're enjoying this episode. Coming up on Christmas Eve, be here for Christmas 1942, featuring author Peter Harmson discussing his book, Dark Christmas. One of the uh, interesting things about war is that it gives us a uh, much deeper knowledge about what it really means to be human, like brings both the proverbially best and the worst in, in, in people. This is uh, even more the case when we are talking about Christmas in wartime. We'll also have radio excerpts and music of the time to recreate Christmas 1942. It's all Christmas Eve on Point of the Spear. Gift giving season is here, and for the military history lover on your list, Check out my book about the Black Medal of Honor recipients of World War II. Immortal Valor chronicles these timeless heroes' life journeys through all the pain and struggle until their ultimate triumphs. I hope you purchase the book or audiobook, which is available now in stores and online. Now back to the conversation. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but he felt sort of an embarrassment that he didn't have a formal education. Is that correct? Yes, what had happened was all of his older brothers had gone to this Appleby school in England. I believe it's in Southern England. And he would have been slated to go there to get his, his higher education. But his father died when he was 11, so that was close to him. So yes, all through his life, he felt a shortcoming. Uh, although he was well-read, we, we know that, uh, interesting, a book was written about the books of his library and they can tell that the books were, they weren't just show. He had actually read the books and they know this because he was, he couldn't help himself to edit. He would, he would find mistakes <laughs> in the book and he would correct it. So they, whenever they find those corrections, they know, okay, like for instance, we, we know you read Gulliver, Gulliver's Travels because there's all these little notes in the book that he found a mistake or something. So he was extremely well, well read. So he felt he had to make up for this lack of education and reading. But what's other, also very exciting about him is that when you look at letters that he wrote, you could be confident 
that was how he talked because uh, Jefferson observed him writing and he says he writes very quickly. So that means that it's kind of like a stream of consciousness. I see. So yeah. when we read his letters, we can be confident that, you know, he did have a tremendous vocabulary and, and I think, but he still, he had in the war, he had what I call these, these pen men. They would be these aides to camp that had the higher education and he would have them check his letters, kind of like a spell check, grammar check kind of a thing. Like Hamilton. Right. And then Hamilton, he got to the point where he knew Washington so well, he could just write the letter. He could just write it as if, <laughs> as if Washington <laughs> wrote it himself. In his own but, voice, I'm sure. Yeah, pretty much. So, uh, yeah. but yes, he was always conscious of the fact of his shortcoming of not having the higher education, but he was extremely well read. And um, he obviously had, you know, other tremendous capabilities. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's bring it up to the revolution. And the question I wanted to um, ask about that, that you could uh, illuminate us is, there were many plots against him. He was not supported by his fellow commanders. On the contrary, they plotted against him and he called them a cabal. Could you speak about this? Yes, there was the Conway cabal. And uh, what had happened was you had, uh, of course, the, the, the siege of Boston, you know, went well in the sense that the, the British had to vacate. But then pretty much after that, everything went very badly. So you had the, the terrible the Battle of Long Island and the retreat through Manhattan and then the retreat from the, from the Jerseys. And even though uh, Trenton and Princeton basically saved the war, and those are probably considered Washington's two most important battles. There were still people that even though he showed you know, his, his nature there and what he could do, there were still those that felt that they could do better. So General Gates was in charge when he had the Battle of Saratoga. That was really Benedict Arnold, uh, strangely. <laughs> Yeah. Who, really won, who really won that battle because Gates wanted to just basically stay behind his defensive lines where Arnold wanted to be um, offensive, which was his nature. But then Gates got all the credit, which is one of the things that troubled Arnold. But then Gates started rising in prominence. And so there were those, well, it's natural. He has that experience as a British officer. Ironically, he was at the Battle of Monongahela. It's funny, the Battle of Monongahela is like a who's who of, you know, all these <laughs> people to see. I've seen the list. People should look it up on the internet. It's amazing how many future famous people were there at that battle. There were the junior varsity at the time. That's right. <laughs> so so there was this Conway Cabal and they, there was this effort to, to replace them. Now, it's amazing. At Valley Forge was a crucible in many ways. So Washington, he, he's trying, he's there because he's trying to keep an eye on the British in Philadelphia. So he's fighting the British. He's fighting starvation. His men are in rags. He's trying to get clothing. And then there's this Conway cabal going on. So he has, he has to fight like, you know, three enemies in addition to all the illness and the sickness. But this is where he had served in the House of Burgesses. And this political experience came to his aid. And then there were his supporters and they alarmed him uh, alerted him to the this conspiracy going on and very deftly using his political experience I wish I could quote it but he one of his uh, former aides uh, is it Joseph Reed he wrote a very negative letter back and forth to Gates and Washington said oh uh, Mr. Reed I'm so sorry but in opening the correspondence I saw this letter that you you sent to General Gates I couldn't help but read it so it was, it was very it was very clever how he <laughs> he let it be known that oh, I know what's going I know what's going on but uh, so once that was passed uh, it did not uh, go well because the Battle of Camden later in the war it was actually called the Camden Races. It was amazing how fast uh, General Gates got on a horse and retreated from that battle, and he huh. never recovered from that disgrace. In South Carolina? Yes, in South Carolina, Camden, South Carolina. Yeah. So Gates, he faded away, and then at a certain, at that point in the war, it's just decided that, you know, Washington is the man. And I just wanted to say, too, that um, in the end, at the end, I wanted to read a couple of things from Wengel's book about Washington, if we have time. Sure. But yeah. he, he was a 
battlefield commander. In other words, he wasn't back at some remote uh, command center. When there was when he was in, in charge of a battle, he was out there. As a matter of fact, some of the letters of the soldiers at the time, they got mad at him. They they wrote in these letters that, oh, the General Washington, he exposes himself to too much danger. And there's, especially at the Battle of Princeton, there was one point where he was right between the two firing lines and one of his aides actually covered his face. He couldn't watch the British let loose the valley. And there he was on a white horse <laughs> standing there in the middle of the, not a single bullet hit him. So it's crazy. He, he could never, uh, he never be challenged for his bravery in, uh, in battle. Let's take a uh, look at his post-war years um, after the revolution and um, um, mention the whiskey rebellion that occurred as well. So yes, he um, obviously there was he was concerned about the direction of the country that it was going. That it was called the Articles Confederation. It was a very weak form of government, and then of course, through his leadership, he ended up being president of the Constitutional uh, Convention, the other Constitution. And everybody knew when they saw him president of the Constitu Constitutional Convention that they we're looking at our first president right here. And of course, by unanimous unanimous uh, vote through the uh, through the the college there, he uh, he be, you know, he came in first president. So one of their first concerns was the war debt, and of course, you know, we have our national debt now. They had their national debt; they're trying to pay off. So Hamilton, uh, you know, the treasury had the idea of the uh, the whiskey uh, tax, the you know, the tax on on spirits to try to raise revenue to pay down the debt. And now in Western Pennsylvania was a very rough place, the Pittsburgh area. <laughs> You had had all sorts of, uh, I call it like the Wild West of our country of that time. Oh, I see. Yeah, sure. some pretty hardcore, rough and ready people out there. You had a lot of Revolutionary War veterans. And so when this tax came through, they said, I'm not going to pay that tax. You know, they, they, they saw, you know, you're over there. And at the time, the capital was in Philadelphia. You know, you're so far away, you know. But they, they, were, they were doing a smart thing. I get them credit that. You know, crops go bad, but if you make whiskey, it, it just gets better, right? It doesn't uh, it doesn't go bad. So they were there was a lack of currency, of hard currency. So they were using it for bartering, for actually for you know exchanging mm -hmm. the lack of currency. So they sent out tax collectors and other officials, and some were tarred and feathered. And there was there was one a representative. His house was burned down, and they had seven thousand and a local militia there, 7,000. Now these would have been made up of also obviously Revolutionary War veterans, or at least at least a good part of it. Now these are men that really knew how to use a musket. Yeah. And knew how to stand up in, in battle. So what was Washington gonna do? So we felt that it had to be uh, enforced. It was, uh, it was voted on by Congress to raise this tax. So, but the only time in our country's history you had a Washington, you had a president leading men into battle. So he he did two things simultaneously. He sent out um, representatives to negotiate, but then he also raised an army of thirteen thousand, so almost twice the size of what the, the militia in, in, in uh, the Pittsburgh area. And then, of course, they're marching out, and then a word gets back that they're marching out. And one of the things we forget today, we look at the dollar bill, we look at these paintings, we see these senior statesmen, we say, oh, yeah, that's interesting, Washington. But we got to remember, at that time, people thought very differently about him, that he was uh, res admired, respected, even loved, but he was also feared. Hmm. They knew, based on what he did in the revolution, that when he started something, he was going to finish it so that when word got to the conspirators that George Washington is coming at the head of an army to crush the rebellion, they said going around, yeah, these taxes, they're not so bad. <laughs> 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 so, he smart. so the, so the, so the army did come and Washington didn't actually, he, he figured that he learned that they were backing down. And so he didn't actually enter uh, Pittsburgh, but the army did go in and the conspirators were rounded up. And very interestingly, they were sentenced to death, but Washington, he pardoned them. He, that was one of his first uh, pardons. He, yeah. But so in other words, oh. it was very uh, effective, but it was a real test of our, of our early country. You know, you know, 
nobody, obviously nobody likes taxes, but do we have the right to impose taxes? And Washington felt that it was legal and it and it uh, and it should be enforced. But but it was a uh, an interesting part of our history that doesn't get you know a lot of attention because it was a fairly brief uh, campaign. But nonetheless, yeah. it, it it showed a part of Washington that uh, the respect that people had for him. One thing about that convention. Um, also that I remember from my reading is um, when it was obvious that Washington was the perfect choice to become president, um, he had sort of planted the seed there by attending the uh, convention in uniform. Isn't that true? So that- Yes, yeah, so would... uh, in 1774, and 75, yeah, it was actually in 1775, right before Lexington and Concord, he did come. In his, now, there's some consensus. Some people think he came in his French and Indian War uniform. I believe the correct would be the uniform that became his Revolutionary War uniform, which was the Fairfax County. He was the colonel in the Fairfax County militia, and always being the, the fashion plate. He was always conscious of the latest fashion. So he would have come in the fashion of that time, which is the uniform uh, you see you know, throughout the revolution. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was a strange time. It wasn't like, okay, I want to be commander in chief. You, people didn't talk like that. You sort of kind of made it known that, yeah, if you ask me, I think I might, I might do it. And yeah. You know, yeah so, he was, like <laughs> so he was kind of, kind of advertising the fact that he had military experience and, uh, of course, there's, there's, the joke was that every committee he was on, he was the head of the committee because he was the tallest man in the room. He was, uh, th there's different disputes of his of his height. I believe he was six foot four because when they laid him off for his casket, he, he was measured at uh, six foot three and a half. But of course you shrink when you get older. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, when you're when you're laying prone, you do expand a bit. So I think it's, um, it's easy that, to estimate that he was six foot four. I happen to base by some strange quirk of genetics on the exact same dimensions because they the man that made the clothing for the Mount Vernon display made my clothing and he had access to Washington's dimensions and it's the same amazing before. amazing so, interesting uh coincidence there <laughs> yeah yeah um to close how would you uh sum up the man his essential qualities that we can uh oh. that are timeless yeah, I would like to uh, read some a couple experts uh, by a uh, book by Edward Langle. Once again, I recommend him as a good resource. Uh, this is at the close of his book, so it's George Washington, The Military Life, and he's summing up uh, Washington. On occasion, Washington's regard for his officer's judgment got him into trouble. Before battles or during periods of maneuver, he liked to convene his council of war. This led to some people calling him indecisive, but there was an antidote for, to his indecision. On hearing gunfire and experiencing the adrenaline surge that came with it, Washington typically ceased equivocating and acted with a plum. Poise in battle was one of his most obvious merits. Now this particular comment, um, I had uh, a discussion with another historian by the name of uh, John Rees, and we, it was actually his idea. I think it was the fox hunting. He was an avid fox hunter. Mm. If you think of the fox hunt, it's like a military operation. You're, you're chasing the fox with a, using like a combined arms with the, uh, the dogs, the hounds chasing, and then you're on horseback. It's a, it's a fast moving event. There's even communication with the fox hunting horn. And I think this ease and this, he was totally at home in the saddle. And I think being mounted on horseback, and also this natural sense about him that he uh, he just had no fear in battle. So that was one of his strategic uh, or tactical, I should say, uh, most important aspects was once, once he smelled the gunpowder, he, it was like something snapped in his head, 10th Regiment was over here, 10th Regiment over there. He, he just, he, he came to his, to his uh, forefront. Unnatural. Now this could be Washington's epitaph. I think it's very fair. I have to say what Lengel wrote. This is another quote from Lengel's book. Washington was imperfect. In strictly military terms, he does not merit the comparisons that have sometimes been made between him 
and the generals like Marlborough, Frederick the Great, Napoleon, or Robert E. Lee. Yet he remains a remarkable man, one of those Tolstoyan figures whose acts determined the course of history. James Thomas Flexner has called him the indispensable man. Nobody, not Nathaniel Green or Henry Knox, and certainly not Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, or John Adams, united the military, political, and personal skills that made Washington unique. I think that pretty much sums them up. Absolutely. But your book, so people can go out and get it, is called George Washington at War, 1776. John, thank you so much for coming on the show today and Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you, sir. Well, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to you, Rob. That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for joining me. Coming up on Christmas Eve, be here for Christmas 1942, featuring author Peter Harmson discussing his book, Dark Christmas. One of the uh, interesting things about war is that it gives us a much deeper knowledge about what it really means to be human, like brings both the proverbially best and the worst in, in, in people. This is uh, even more the case when we are talking about Christmas in wartime. We'll also have radio excerpts and music of the time to recreate Christmas 1942. It's all Christmas Eve on Point of the Spear. And if you like what you hear, leave a rating, a review, or just click the follow button. You can find me on Twitter at Rob Child. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spear. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.